Now, if I just have the term bird, this is more infinite, less finite. This is more to the infinite side, less to the finite side. In what means? It can be any bird. It can be any bird. Now, by saying bird, I've actually limited it to what? One type of creature. Okay? Basically, it has to have wings, feathers, a bill, right? So, but this is more infinite. Now what? Now I've told you blackbird. Saying what? It's got to be a blackbird. It's got to be a, and so, so what about red? Huh? What about a cardinal? Does a cardinal fit here? Huh? What about a blue jay? What about a green jay? Have you all ever seen a green jay? We have green jays down here. They're beautiful birds. They live mostly among the wild olives and uh, uh, the wisacha, the, the uh, back in the dense brush and stuff like that. So, so what are we saying? If I'm telling you that it is a black bird, then what? What about red? Is is it a red bird? No. Is it a blue bird? No. Is it a green bird? What have I done? I have limited that bird by defining it. Then it cannot be any of these. Are you with me? This is what happens with Hashem. When you start giving him attributes, when you start saying God is this, God is that, you're giving to him attributes, you're defining him, he becomes more clear to you, more distinct to you, this aspect of him does. But, what? You're limiting him. Okay, so uh, this is this is what we were talking about in our in our Judaism 101 class. These are things that these are things that the sages discuss and debate and argue. Can he be infinite yet be finite? Can God be infinite and yet be finite? So, is he a God of grace? Is he a God of grace? Yes. Yes. But you just make him, in effect, finite. Because to be this, that means automatically what? You cannot be that. You see what I'm saying? The minute I say that God is this, by defining him, I knock everything just like when I say it's a black bird. What did I do? I knocked off red bird, blue bird, green bird. It's not that. So when I say God is this, by making him clearer to me in my understanding, I have, in effect, limited him. So when we were discussing this last Shabbat, is this that God is both finite and infinite at the same time? You say, how can that be? I don't know. If I knew how he did that, I'd be God. Because only God knows these things. But what that does is it makes it possible, number one, for us to exist, and number two, for the Messiah to exist. So what I'm sharing with you is this idea of being circumspect, of looking around. Why? What does this have to do with pain? What does this have to do with your mouth? To be careful that we have all the information. To only speak what we know. I must be careful that I have all of the information and I only speak what I know. Remember that we have shared with you recently that in Jewish court, according to Torah, Circumstantial evidence and hearsay are not permitted in any fashion. But a person is judged innocent or guilty by the witness of two, uh, the testimony of two or three witnesses. How does a person testify? With their mouth, right? This is with which you witness, you speak it out. 
you are only allowed to testify as to what you have actually seen. Remember I shared with you the woman who was found in the very act of adultery, saying that if she was found in the very act of adultery, what it is saying is that there were at least two witnesses who saw her actually committing the sin. Not that they saw the man go in the house. They had to actually witness the scene. Then they could testify. The woman could not even could not testify against herself. She could defend herself. But she could not testify against herself. And even if she told this person over here, yes, I did it, guess what? This person could not go and stand in front of the judge and say, she told me she did it. That is not acceptable in, in Jewish court. That is hearsay evidence. Even if she confessed to this person. This person had to have seen or heard with their own, with their, as, 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 with their own eyes, they had to witness the act. And again, this sounds, this sounds, you know, well, well then what, about, because you see a lot of criminals, well, how many crimes go unwitnessed? So what happens to those criminals? But the reasoning behind this is that it is better to allow a criminal to go free than to, than to discipline, punish, put to death an innocent person. So we are only to speak what we know. I'm only to testify as to what information I truly have, that I truly know, that I've witnessed, I've seen. <coughs> this last Shabbat, we, <coughs> excuse me, we, we introduced Exodus chapter 19. And one of the things that, that the scripture states there is that Hashem tells Moshe, to tell the people, say unto the people, you have seen these things. You have seen these things. And Rashi comments here, what does he mean? Why does he say you have seen these things? Speaking of Yav Suf, the parting of the Red Sea, the turning the bitter waters to sweet, the bringing of the manna, the water coming out of the rock. He says, you have seen these things and you are witnesses. And Rashi commentates there, Rashi states there that the reason why he uses that, this, this terminology is because he's telling them, look, this is not a tradition for you. If you were there, then it's not a tradition. It is an event. You witnessed it. You saw it. Traditions, they're colored. What is true and what is made up. There is, in tradition, there usually is, is some truth there. But there's also a lot of for example, patriotism, right? America, rah, 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 patriotism, not denigrate. Part of patriotism, part of the tradition in our patriotism is that George Washington could not tell a lie. That he chopped down a cherry tree, right? That he threw a dollar across the Delaware River. Are these stories true? Well, if you've seen the Delaware River, anybody here ever see the Delaware River? 
Huh? It's a few miles wide. It's a wide river. It's done, well, it actually starts up in Pennsylvania somewhere and goes. Whose picture was on that dollar? Huh? Whose picture was on that dollar? Whose picture was on the dollar? <laughs> His own. <laughs> Even if and, and they didn't have it was a coin, but the honesty that the the truth is that nobody can throw a coin that far. Okay, this is what I'm saying. That we have traditions. There's truth in them. They're placed there to encourage us to what have you, what have you. But there's some stuff that's added information. It's not necessarily all exactly the truth. So Rashi comments on here on, on, on in this portion when God says, "You you have seen these things." You've seen these miracles. That it's not coming to them handed down from their fathers, generation to generation to generation. No, you were there. You actually saw the sea part. This is a real event for you. So what? Saying that that generation knew because they saw it. So, you're only supposed to speak what you know, what you have actually seen. Yochanan, John speaks to this as well, when he says, we do not tell you of things that we have heard from someone else. He says, we do testify of those things which we have seen and known. They saw Yeshua, they lived with him, they watched him die, they buried him, they saw him alive again. He ate with them, he walked with them, he talked with them. To this they testify. So, the mouth is to be careful. That's why we only have one. Can you imagine if we had two? You could hold a conversation with yourself. Who would win the debate? There's a Hebrew term. It's called Lashon Hara. Everyone? Lashon Hara. Again? Lashon Hara. So, Lashon means tongue. Hara means evil. Remember we talked about the Ayin Tov and the Ayin Ra? The good eye and the evil eye. Okay, so here you have Ra. The evil tongue. What is the evil tongue? The evil tongue is the tongue that I use to bring injury to someone. And it is absolutely forbidden by Torah. I may not, I may not spread lies about you. I may not gossip about you. I am not even allowed to make, make innuendo. To hint. In fact, in Judaism, my responsibility is to protect you and rather lose my own reputation than have you lose yours. This is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself.
Even if you have done wrong, I'm not supposed to share that information unless I'm testifying against you. Because I'm not to damage your, your reputation by any means if I can help it. What I am supposed to do to you is come to you. Do these words sound familiar? To come to you and speak to you concerning what's going on in your life. But even then, I must do it with humility in such a way as to, as best as possible, not bring embarrassment to you. If your brother has sinned, what does the scripture say? You are to go to him, how? Privately. And try to make things right. Now, if I go to you, if, if I go to you and I bring a crowd of people with me, what? What's your response going to be? If I, if I have a disagreement with you or whatever, I have something against you, and I come to you, and I bring ten other people with me, Yeah, you're going to get defensive, you're going to be upset, you're going to be offended. How am I going to make things right? Because you see, the whole idea in Judaism is rectification. To make it right. So I come to you privately. But I get in your face. Boy, I've got a bone to pick with you. And I rail on you. How are you going to feel? Same way, no? Angry, offended, embarrassed. And do you think that we're going to be friends after this? You see what's taking place here? This is what Torah is all about. Torah is not about destroying. Torah is about rectifying, making it right. What Torah teaches us is how to love my neighbor as myself. Therefore, Torah teaches that I am not permitted to offend you. I'm not to be a stumbling block to you. Torah teaches that I am not allowed to embarrass you. I may not embarrass my brother, my sister. This was a hard one for me because I'm a jokester. And I, I threw the insults. When I worked at the school, the kids actually, most of them, not all of them, but most of them enjoyed it. They'd walk by and I'd say something and everybody would laugh and they'd come, they'd actually, some of them would come back a few times, so I, I would insult them more. <laughs> but I hurt some feelings. I was just joking. I wasn't trying to offend them, I wasn't trying to hurt them, but I did because they took it personal or whatever. And I would realize that this person was upset and I would, I would go to them and apologize. Look, I was just, you know. When, you, when a person says, I didn't mean anything by it, that's not a good thing to have to say, to have come out of your mouth. This is one of the things as I was becoming more and more aware of Torah that God really began to convict me of. To what? Shut your pay. Keep it closed. If I'm going to make somebody laugh, it should be at my expense, not yours. I should insult myself rather than insulting you. I should rather have my feelings hurt than ever have your feelings hurt. We do occasionally hurt people's feelings, even without realizing it, without knowing it. This is what Yeshua is talking about when you come to the altar and you realize you've hurt someone. 
Go to them and make it right. Leave your gift. Go make it right. And then come back. And make your sacrifice. We are to be careful how we use our mouth. Because the truth is the mouth is the most potent weapon you have. You know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is a lie. The truth of the matter is, there are words that are more painful than any stick or any stone. I had a person come to me one time a few years back, and they said, you know, I was... so verbally abused by my parents. The things that they would say to me. The way they would treat me. And she said, the truth of the matter is, I would much rather them have thrown sticks and stones at me than <clears throat> hurl the words at me that they were hurling at me. Why? Well, because you see the bruise or the broken bone from a stick or a stone that heals. Those words, they go into the ears and penetrate the heart. That's very difficult to do. What doctor can reach in there and make that right? And so we're to be very careful with what we say. And how we say it. Do we ever listen to ourselves talk? Our tone of voice. My tone of voice is very important. So, I have a son who loves sports. He's fanatical about it. And he hates, he hates to lose. Now by saying he hates to lose, that means he hates for the Cowboys to lose, he hates for the Spurs to lose, he hates for, and don't interrupt him while he's watching the game. And if his team is losing, just be quiet. Because you may receive your head back on the platter. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because he doesn't mean to hurt. His frustration is not with this person or that person. His frustration is with the fact that his team is losing. But the tone of his voice hurts. So, what? Change your tone. This is what it means to be circumspect that we are watching. And it's not just watching what comes out of my mouth, but it's watching how it comes out. In other words, what? I'm to be listening to how the other person would hear it. If I were the other person, how would they hear this? What would this say to them? How would they feel? Why? Because I am to put myself in their position. If I were being spoken to in such a way, how would I feel? What would I think? And so we're to be careful with these things, that we do not injure others with our words, with our tone. We are not permitted to use Lashon Chara 
tinerii mei. It is said that the Shomchara is equivalent to murder. Because you have killed that person's spirit. You've cut them on the inside. Yeshua says the same thing. That the person, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. The person who hates his brother in his heart has murdered him already. And a person who calls his brother an idiot is guilty, is in danger of hellfire, of judgment. said don't be stupid when I tell someone don't be stupid and I know down here particularly that's not a good word but when I tell someone that in that way how does it make that person feel like they're being stupid <coughs> that's what you show us talking about How about when somebody does something or says something and my response is, oh, that's stupid. Or my favorite one, that's just plain stupid. You see what I'm saying? I had to confess my sin to Hashem this week because I'm guilty too. When I'm speaking to you, it's the old adage of what? When you're pointing your finger at someone else, be careful because you've got three pointing back at you. So I know what I'm speaking because I'm here too. And a few days ago, there were some concrete workers who were repairing a curb. And we were standing there talking, there was a group of us standing there talking. And they were not doing it appropriately, they were not doing it correctly. And we were back on the scene later. And I made a comment. About what a, not a good job it was. And boom, instantly, I was cutting my own heart. Why did I say it? Did it help these guys in? Did it help the job? Did it change the concrete? Did it do anything? No. Usually, when we do this, it's for appearance sake. We're trying to make ourselves look better than somebody else. We're climbing higher on their backs on their heads. Saying what? You've heard them called put-downs. What is a put-down? Something goes down, there's an equal and opposite reaction of what? Something goes up. Basically, the put-down is used to bring myself up in my own and in other people's estimation. As soon as I said it, I felt it, I turned around, I walked away, I asked God to please forgive me. The men weren't there, they didn't hear, but I knew what I had done. There was no reason for me to say anything. There was no need for me to say anything. I've done bad jobs too. You? I've done stupid moronic things too. I had a brother who jumped off the bridge into the arroyo. Not a smart thing, eh? But everybody was doing it. My mom could not ask him, well, if everybody else jumps off the bridge, are you going to jump off the bridge? Because his answer was this. I may not damage you in any way if I can possibly help it. 
Rather, I would damage myself. It's supposed to be my heart. This is what Judaism teaches. I'm not to speak ill of you. I'm not to tell stories about you. And if I know something about you, guess what? Take a look. And the Torah tells us that there is a curse for the person who speaks Lashon Tara. You know what it is? Yes, she spoke ill towards Moshe. She said, who put you in charge of everybody? How come we can't have more power, more authority? And God struck her with leprosy. Remember what Moshe said? In the beginning of the book of Exodus, when God calls Moshe at the burning bush. Do you remember what one of the signs is? He puts his hand in his cloak and he brings it out and what? He's got leprosy. He puts it back in and he brings it out and he's clean. What the sages say is it is because just before that, Moshe was speaking ill against the people of Israel in their bondage. And God said, <clears throat> excuse me, let me show you something. Stick your head in your cloak. And he does, and he brings it out, and it's leprous. Okay, now stick it in again, and he does, and he brings it out, and it's clean. The leprosy, the word is tsara, but it starts with the word tsari. Tsara is not what we call leprosy today. It's not the disease of, uh, you know, where your body parts start falling off and things like that. That is, that's not tsara. It was a miscommunication somewhere down there a few hundred years ago, and so that became our idea of leprosy. But le leprosy is actually more of a psoriasis type of a skin ailment. So, <laughs> if you have psoriasis, psoriasis, start checking your tongue. Yeah, some people it's most difficult. But check this out. So, how many of you know what psoriasis is? Basically, you get bumps and rashes and itches and things like that, right? Is it a deadly disease? Mm -hmm. Then why did these people have to be excommunicated from the camp, put in their own village, put in their own place or whatever? They were not allowed to be in communication with anybody else. When they came into town, they had to cover their faces and they had to call out, what, do you remember? Unclean. Unclean. So that everybody could would clear a path and get away from them. And yet, why did they have to cover their face and why did they have to call out unclean? Because psoriasis, psoriasis is not deadly, neither is it a communicable disease. It is an autoimmune disease. In other words, what, what, is auto, what does autoimmune mean? You're attacking yourself. Your body's attacking itself. So why would these people have to cover their face and call out unclean? Because they said something that they shouldn't. What's on your face? Your mouth. Your mouth. What did they do? La Shonhara. They spoke evil. Therefore, God strikes them down with this disease, but this disease is not communicable, and this disease is not deadly, then why do they have to do this? Because God is demonstrating by this discipline, by this punishment, God is demonstrating that these people have used their mouth to kill someone. It is in effect, these people have in effect committed murder. By the way, the rabbis teach that disease comes from sin. 
that when we sin, those sins attach themselves to your bones, to my bones. And it becomes disease. It's not too far-fetched because there are many things, many diseases today that are listed under autoimmune. That is, it is my body attacking myself. Why does my body attack itself? Well, the sages say, the rabbis say, your body's attacking itself because you have a guilty conscience about something. There's something in there that has attached itself to your bones and your body is literally eating itself up over what you have done. You're punishing yourself. So, how far this goes, we do know that what the wages of sin is. And we all, what, have to die. You see? Why? It's the curse. So, we're to be careful. We are to guard the tongue. We're to guard the tongue with everything we have. Turn to the book of James, Yaakov. By the way, I posted an article last week on why Yaakov is called James. Before you go there, go to Matthew chapter. <laughs> I saw that. At least it wasn't with your, ta your tongue. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 13, 15, 15, first, Matthew chapter 15. Yeshua's having this debate with some of the Pushim. Not all of them, some of them. <coughs> By the way, people use this debate here to say, you see, you shouldn't follow the tradition. Why are you studying Talmud? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Because Yeshua says here about the tradition, uh, following the tradition rather than following the Word of God, which is not what he says. What he says is, why do you also transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? He does not say that the tradition is bad or evil or wrong. He says when you use that to replace or to try to escape from obeying God, then yes, it's wrong. They're having a debate over washing hands. And Yeshua tells them that it is not what you put into your mouth, by the way. Uh, this is a debate that is used by people saying that, well, he did away with kosher, kosher food. That's not the debate. The debate is not about what, what is food and what is not food. The debate is about whether or not you should wash your hands. Whether washing your hands makes something clean or unclean. And Yeshua's argument is whether or not you wash your hands does not make the food we're talking about ritually, spiritually clean or unclean, not whether it makes it dirty with germs or whatever. Because the, the, this group of Pushim had the concept that to wash your hands made your food clean, spiritually clean, religiously pure. So if you ate with unwashed hands, then your food was religiously unpure, impure. And you should say, no, that's not the way it works. Verse 10, he says, Yeshua calls to the crowd and says to them, Hear and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that makes the man unholy. Look, but what comes out of the mouth, this makes the man unholy. Saying what? It's not whether or not you wash your hands that makes you pure, pure or impure. It's the words you speak. What are you saying? Which ultimately comes from the heart, from the mind. Which is where he goes with this. Because what is coming out of your heart, by the way, I've told people before, if you want to know what a person really thinks, get them drunk. <laughs> because drunks tell you the truth. <laughs> if you want to know what a person's really feeling, what they what they really think, 
listen to them when they're drunk. Because when a person's drunk, they don't have any feelings and they don't care. And they will tell you exactly what's on their mind. Just say. So everybody's going to go home and get their wife or husband drunk or whatever. <laughs> what do you really think of me? So, he says, uh, what comes out of the mouth, this makes the man unholy. So further down, he explains to them, verse 16, are you st also still lacking understanding? Yeshua said, don't you grasp that whatever goes into your mouth passes into the stomach and then is ejected into the sewer. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Say what? How many of us say something and then say, I didn't mean that? You ever say that? Mm -hmm. You know what God says? You did mean it or you would not have said it. This is serious stuff to you. <clears throat> How many of us um, tell a joke on somebody, pull a joke on somebody, and then we go, just kidding, right? Or you say something and then you go, just kidding. Guess what? You actually work. We do things mean because we're mean. We say things mean because we're mean. That's what's in our heart. So, when I'm in public, I'm this nice, gregarious, happy-go-lucky person. But when I'm at home, or I'm by myself, got a temper and words come out of my mouth and I'm talking about this person and talking about that person and all of these things and I've got these anger issues oh but now it's time for me to go out in public again so I stand on that happy face what's going on inside because that's where God is concerned and you see what's going on inside here eventually one way or other works its way out. Mm -hmm. It works its way out. It will. Is it worse than the man thinking in his heart? So is he. So is he. Sure. And what you show saying here is you you speak what you are. So now let's go to James chapter 3. And we're going to close. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, since you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. Saying what? I've shared this with you before. This is one of my greatest fears that I feed you wrong information. One of my greatest fears, I'm, I, I try to be very, very careful when I'm teaching Shabbat, when I'm teaching these classes, when I'm teaching the Judaism class, that I'm giving you correct and right information. Because I have to stand before Hashem and answer as to what I have taught. And this is the warning here. This is why he's saying this. Not many of you should become teachers, my brother and sister, since you know that we will receive a strict judgment. Why? I'm not only responsible for me. Now I'm responsible for you. For we all stumble in many ways. If someone does not stumble in speech, he's a perfect man. What? If you've never fallen in the way you talk, you are perfect. able to bridle the whole body as well. If you're able to control your tongue, you can control everything. You have no problem in any other area. If we put bits into the mouths 
of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole body as well. What? You put the bit in the mouth, you're controlling the mouth. By controlling the mouth, you control the entire animal. Why? All you have to do is put a little tug, right? And the bit does what? The bit pulls on the cheek, puts pressure, and that pressure will turn the horse's head, and where the horse's head goes, the rest of the horse will follow. See also the ships, though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. See how so small a fire sets ablaze so great a force. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of evil placed among our body parts. It pollutes the whole body and sets on fire the course of life. It sets on the fire of Gehenna. For every species of beast and bird, reptiles and sea creatures is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Adonai and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image of God. Elohim. This is part of the tree of life, by the way. When we get into Netzach, is to remember that I am Betzelma Elohim. I am created in the image of God, but guess what? You are also Betzelma Elohim. You are created in the image of God. And I am to have respect for that that you are created in the image of God. I am to respect that, and that's what he's speaking to. We, we praise God, and yet we curse the human created in the image of God. By the way, you ever pull up to a, a red light and the person in front of you is asleep? And the light turns green, and you get frustrated, and you <laughs> on your horn. Switch places. Have you ever pulled up to a red light, and you fell asleep, you got distracted, and the light was green for two or three seconds, and somebody behind you, boop, boop, boop. Question. How did you feel when they blew their horn at you? I usually don't appreciate it. I understand. People are in a hurry, what have you, what have you. But usually it's just a matter of impatience. And usually for me too, what? It's a matter of impatience. Mm -hmm. Saying what? Do to others what you would have them do to you. That's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> In fact, most of the talk tonight is exactly that. You remember, I have spoken to you about this. How would you feel if somebody said this to you? How would you feel if someone used this tone of voice on you? How would you feel? This is exactly what we're talking about because you see, I'm to love my neighbor. How? As I love myself. Saying what? I'm to put myself in the other person's shoes. How would I feel? How do I feel when somebody pulls up behind me? And I'm a little slow at the green light because I've got my mind somewhere. You see, you don't know that person in that car in front of you. <clears throat> they might have just come out of the hospital sitting beside a loved one who's not going to make it. You don't know that. And because of my impatience, I beat them. I hold them. And they're in distress already in their soul and their spirit. My mom, a 
few years back. I was in the hospital. And she had been there for a couple of weeks. And we were very concerned for her. She finally got out. And my boys and I had gone and picked her up and we took her home. And we stayed there, making sure, getting her into bed, making sure she was comfortable, getting her something. And by the time it finished, by the time she had gotten out, we got her home, we got everything done. It was very good. And I was worn out. And we were driving, we were living here in Harlingen at the time, and so we were driving back from Rio Hondo. I stopped at the one red light in town. And the boys were there talking, and I was thinking about mom and everything that had been going on and I saw we were at the red light and the other light turns yellow, right? I saw it turn yellow. So I let my foot off the brake and my vehicle rolled into the intersection. Just as I got into the intersection, then my light turned green. There just so happened to be a police officer sitting right behind me. Instantly turns on his lights. And wrote me a citation. I told him, we just got out, got back from getting, taking mom from the hospital and got her home and in bed and I'm tired. I'm just trying to get home. He said, well, sir, I'm, I'm writing you a citation. Okay. So a couple of weeks later, I went to stand before the judge. And I told the officer, I told the judge, I said, I said, Your Honor, I said, I don't know what I can plead here. You know, you make a suggestion, I'm going to tell you what happened, and then you tell me what you think. He says, okay. So I told him. I said, Your Honor, I said, I did not run the red light. I did not go through the intersection. I just, I took my foot off the brake and I rolled because in my eye, in, in my side view, I saw that light change. And I just instinctually took my foot off the brake because I was tired. We'd been with my mom in the hospital for a couple of weeks and it was just really rough and I just wanted to get home. And the judge listened to my story. He said, Mr. King, we've all been there. We'll dismiss the charges. He put himself in my place. And he felt what I was feeling. And it changed his composure and his attitude towards me. This is what the, speak, the, the scripture is speaking to. We need to stop justifying ourselves because of who I am. And start living myself because of who you are. Rav Shaul says that we are to put preference on the other above ourselves. That I'm to give you preference. If I'm giving you preference, then I will not speak evil concerning you. I will not gossip about you. I will not lie about you. And I will not even give an innuendo. In fact, I ought not to cause you any embarrassment at all. I ought to rather embarrass myself than have you to be embarrassed. This is the counting of the Omer. And we're almost there. In fact, in 10 days will be the ascension of Yeshua. And 10 days later, Shavuot. The whole purpose of the counting of the Omer is to take a little away from the beast and give it to God. Take a little away from the flesh. 
and give it to God. One of the things that we're supposed to be working on in the counting of the law is how we treat one another, and particularly with our friends. We all fail. The sad thing is we don't have to. We can do better. We're living in a world where words are hurling back and forth in politics, in religion, in families, in friends, in homes, and everywhere you go. The words are just flying. So, how about if we bring a little peace into this world? How about if I be one to stand up and say, you know what? Enough is enough. And I refuse to hurt anyone. Through word or through deed. Through action or through inaction. Rather, I will take the hurt than give it to someone else. I will do to others what I would want others to do for me. And this is the way I should live my life. So with that we say, Shalom, Bella,